Okay, good morning. I'd like to welcome you to the Oregon Transportation Commission meeting. You will note that uh, Commissioner Lohman is not with us today. He has served uh, more than actually his fair share of time with the uh, Transportation Commission, a good 10 years, and we will be honoring him in December. Today, we'd like to welcome our newest member, uh, Robert Van Brocklin, who is uh, from Stoll Reeves and has a deep background with a lot of interest in transportation and will uh, just be a wealth of um, knowledge added to the commission and really excited about your addition and the composition here today. So, Director Garrett, I will turn it over to you and I believe you have some comments as well. I, Madam Chair, I appreciate that and I, I too welcome Commissioner Van Brocklin. You, uh, uh, you certainly come to this agency uh, with bona fides that are unquestionable. Uh, I think Mr. Van Brocklin's history in terms of having the privilege of working back in Washington, D.C., um, and the upper body of the United States Senate, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, he brings that wealth of experience. As Chair Bainey indicated, he is a partner with Stoll Reeves, obviously one of the most uh, significant law firms in the state of Oregon here. He brings that experience. Uh, he is engaged in the conversations uh, related to transportation, economic opportunity, livability, that trinity that we see play itself out almost on a daily basis working here at the Department of Transportation. So there is little question that you hit the ground running, no doubt. I think you were confirmed just two days ago, and we have you suited up, ready to go. So lace up. This is going to be a fast run. Um, but we know you'll add value um, and a great perspective to the conversations that play themselves out as we implement what is a historic investment in transportation, uh, as well as an opportunity to craft uh, a future a strategic plan for the Oregon Department of Transportation. Those are two significant spheres of influence that are playing themselves out amongst the um, plethora of opportunities that we have coming at us here in the state of Oregon specific to transportation. So, Commissioner, welcome and thank you, thank you. Um, for your service. Madam Chair, uh, jump into the Director's report right now. I actually am going to yield most of my time to my friend Phil Ditzer, the Federal Highway Administration, and his colleague Michelle Oro. But I do want to speak, uh, and Phil and, and Michelle, if you would come up now, I'm going to speak about uh, um, another recognition we have. We'll speak about two recognitions today. The first being um, an award that we won at the Bentley Systems Year in Infrastructure Conference. Our TransInfo, our asset management program, um, was awarded their 2017 Be Inspired Award. And Madam Chair, that's that good-looking piece of art in front of you right now. Bentley Systems Year in Transportation Con Conference is an annual global gathering of leading professionals in the world of infrastructure design, construction, and operations. And out of 400 nominations by organizations representing 50 countries, ODOT's TransInfo database was recognized for asset information management investment and one of six projects acknowledged as uniquely innovative and demonstrating visionary achievement. So you know our uh, TransInfo database is used to track our highway assets. It's an asset management tool for all intents and purposes, as well as other assets here. It's also used uh, as a data source for our GIS mapping uh, for both state and federal reporting. Since going live in 2011, the project team has been disciplined in its focus, working to consolidate, simplify, and streamline ODOT's data and asset management workflow. And as of today, um, the efficiencies gained have paid for the program itself and actually accrued cost savings, cost avoidance in the order of $2 million. Now, this discipline is um, um, comprised of a host of transportation disciplines, no doubt. But there are two individuals that on point, um, Heather King as well as uh, uh, Lorena Lambert, that I want to extend my kudos to to bring home a very prestigious award. With that, I'm going to switch to our federal highway partners here. Um, and Mr. Ditzler and Ms. Rowe will speak to the 2017 FHWA Environmental Excellence Awards and their recipients being uh, ODOT and specifically our professionals up in Region 1 for an effort they had engaged in, a NEPA process, a comprehensive NEPA process associated with a very important project, the Outer Pal Corridor from um, about Interstate 205 to the, uh, the uh, City of Portland boundary at 176 between Portland and Gresham there. I think with that, not wanting to steal any thunder, Mr. Ditzer, I'll turn it over to you.
Chair Bainey, uh, Commissioners, Director Garrett, uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Uh, my name is Phil Ditzler. I'm the Division Administrator for FHWA. Uh, I'm here with Michelle Aro. Michelle is FHWA's Environmental Program Manager. And uh, we're here to present ODOT with uh, an FHWA Environmental Excellence Award. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's an award that uh, we present every two years. It, uh, we look at projects across the nation, projects that have demonstrated uh, that uh, they protect and enhance the environment you know, while we're fulfilling the need of uh, transportation in growing communities. So it's, uh, it's really looking at uh, innovative and creative approaches that are taken. And this year, the Outer Powell Boulevard uh, was one of 18 projects selected from across the nation again. And, you know, it's our honor to recognize ODOT for the fine work. And Michelle's going to go through a little about uh, the project itself and the citation. And then I'll uh, step up with Director Garrett and Chair Bainey to, to congratulate the, uh, the project staff. Madam Chair, I think I truly appreciate uh, Mr. Ditzler and Mr. Aro um, sharing that. The significant conversation surrounding Outer Pal was not only the complexities of an area that has, uh, let's just say, not a lot of attention thrown to it, but it is an area of, um, uh, of low income, minority uh, neighborhoods and such. And I think part of the award addresses the way we engaged the, uh, the challenges in terms of underrepresented and challenged neighborhoods and, and communities here. And I think the, the professionalism and the discipline that the team promoted there to ensure that all voices and all perspectives were heard, very important to me. And I think that underpins that, uh, that 2017 federal award. Madam Chair, with that, I stand down and I thank you for the time. Well, thank you. It's a great way to start off the day. Thank you very much for that and congratulations to the team. So next we have public comment, and I have a couple of individuals that would like to approach the commission. Uh, if you are not on the list and you'd like to approach the commission on an item as well, just please let us know and we'll call you up. I'd like to call Ms. Leanne Ferguson first, and uh, Dave, Dave Hagenberg, you are next. So please, Leanne, the floor is yours. I think this is working, perfect. Thank you, Chair Bainey and Commissioners and Director Garrett. My name is Leanne Ferguson, and I am representing the Street Trust and the Safe Routes to School Network this morning. It is very nice to meet some of you and to see the rest of you again. Um, thank you for your commitment to making streets safe for our kids, parents, grandparents, and neighbors. And congratulations to our Region 1 team for their FHW, FHWA Environmental Excellence Award. Um, uh, the Street Trust and the Safe Routes to School Network also has some uh, requests and considerations for you. Uh, you will find the Street Trust comments detailed in a letter um, and support for our active prioritizing active transportation projects uh, supported by over 500 individuals that I've included with my comments today. But for my testimony, I'd like to touch on a topic that affects me and my community, which is Safe Routes to School. 
Um, in House Bill 2017, our state leaders and you made a giant step by investing $125 million over the next 10 years in safe routes to school infrastructure projects, and I want to thank you very, very much. In addition to safe streets, we must address other issues facing parents and students. For example, as many kids have never really walked or biked to get anywhere before. They lack the skills and knowledge to safely navigate their streets. This lack of knowledge can be overcome by education and encouragement programs. Just last month, students like Liz completed a 10-hour bike safety education course as part of a Safe Routes to School program and was told by her father after that that she could now bicycle to school. Uh, she was ecstatic. She exclaimed that it was the best day of her life, that she had passed a huge marker in her childhood, and that she was afforded some freedom and now a healthy way to get to school. Um, Liz's story is actually not unique. Um, it's one I've heard in Portland, Eugene, Springfield, Redmond, Bend, Prineville, Amity, Ashland, Seaside, and many more communities where there are small and thriving safe routes to school programs. Um, our goal is for all students to have the same opportunity that Liz has had. While we fully support the recommendation to invest six million for education and encouragement programs, we also encourage the OTC to at least support ODOT's recommendation to double the current education funding to three million dollars in the STIP um, and find an effective way to combine the new safe routes to school infrastructure program with the existing, albeit small, education program. Both parts are equally important. Um, to that note, yesterday my friend and safe routes to school champion in Milwaukee, Oregon, 11-year-old Trey and his mom, Annie, told me that Trey and his little brother were nearly hit by a car while walking home from school. A car swerved into the bike lane that they usually get to get to take to get to school because there is no sidewalk and came within a few inches of hitting them. Um, there were several other children walking with them, and they were all walking at least three feet away from the white line, but the car that swerved just came really close to them. And um, Annie is just, like, scared and furious, and she told me yesterday that sidewalks cannot come soon enough. In the past six years, uh, Trey had testified to Metro Councilors, Clackamas County, Milwaukee City Council, and even the Joint Committee on Transportation Preservation and Modernization about House Bill 2017. Um, he's not here today because he's in school, but he's been fighting half of his life to get this sidewalk out in front of his school. And the first thing I thought when I talked to Annie yesterday was that if Trey would have actually died by that car, they probably would get the sidewalk faster than, than him being not... Not, I mean, thank God that he wasn't hurt, but... Um, and that thought terrified me, so I wanted to come here this morning. So thank you again for your time, and to you and to ODOT for your investment in safe walking and biking and access to transit. And I look forward to all the safety improvements that House Bill 2017 will bring to our streets, and I look forward to the day when Liz's experience is experienced by a shared experience by all children in Oregon, and the day that Trey can finally walk to school safely. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Leanne, let me just note that your organization and you in particular have also helped to populate House Bill 2017 with the tenants and elements that are in there to be able for us to um, complete those streets and be able to add those sidewalks and be able to get those safety features. Uh, so thank you for your commitment of time and helping us to understand the need as well and our best to Trey. And that, that is, you know, there are many kids and I as a parent and many of us here, you know, we're all wanting the same thing. So thank you for sharing that goal with us. Yeah, thanks. It's a team effort. Thanks. Yes, it is. Thank you. So next I'd like to call Dave, sorry, I have a cold, <laughs> Dave Hog Hogenberg, and then uh, I do not have anyone after Dave signed up, so if you would like to approach the commission, please just let me know. Please, Dave. Oop. Good. Chair Bainey, members of the commission, mm -hmm. Director Garrett, my name is Dave Hogerberg. I'm chair of the Yamhill County Parkway Committee. It's a pleasure to come and visit with you this morning. I've testified, as you know, and so my purpose is twofold today, but one of them is to bring comments on behalf of the president of the Shehalem Valley Chamber of Commerce, Cheryl Kelch, and on behalf of Joya Goodrum, who is the president of the McMinnville Area Chamber of Commerce, you have their written letters, and I won't repeat those but uh, only to say that between those two chambers, they have almost 900 members, about 16,000 jobs are represented by those chambers, and the memberships extend all the way from Newburgh, literally, to Lincoln City, and that whole entire corridor. And so their message to you is that do everything you can to enhance the infrastructure and to modernize transportation projects and how critical that is to, to businesses. It's like an investment in your business. 
transportation and modernization is a critical part of that. So that would be their message if they were able to be here today. And so you have that testimony, but also I want to be on their behalf and on behalf of all of us from Yamhill County to tell you we are going to have an extraordinary event on December 18th at 2 p.m. when the governor and Matt and Chair Bainey and many others will be at the park. They're at the phase one of the bypass for the celebration for the opening of that event. And we're delighted that you'll all be joining us. It is an extraordinary accomplishment. And so uh, we, could, we will all have a chance to say thank you to each other. But uh, we look forward to that event very, very much. Thank you. Excellent. Persistence. That project took a lot of years to uh, come to fruition. So thank you to you and the community uh, and all of the partners in making sure that that happened. So it will be a day of celebration. Yeah. Excellent. And, and you're welcome. And you know, and, and as you say that, I think about that partnership and the people that aren't here yet. And, and you know, somebody told me the projection in the next 20 years is that corridor is going to grow in population by a third. If you live in McMinnville, you don't believe that because McMinnville and the wine end is exploding. And so uh, that is an incredible thing. So there will be many following us that will continue to make this effort. Thank you, Chair. You bet. Wonderful to see you. Thank you. Okay, before I move on, would anyone else like to approach the commission under public comment? Okay, seeing none, we will go on to item C. And this is a presentation on the department uh, request approval for the designation of the internal auditor. And I think this is an important element of House Bill 2017. A lot of uh, the discussions were around accountability and transparency. And uh, in county government, we have an internal auditor who works independently, and it's been an incredible function to be able to uh, utilize that as a tool for continuous improvement. And so I would like to go ahead and turn the floor over to uh, Ms. Hartinger and have an opportunity to uh, discuss what this means for us and the opportunity that's in front of us as well, so please. Great. Good morning, uh, Chair Bainey, members of the Commission. For the record, my name is Marlene Hartinger, Chief Auditor for the Department. I'm pleased to be with you today to share about our audit function and about the long-term engagement with the Commission, with our office. Uh, House Bill 2017 highlighted uh, internal audit as a key accountability provision. Um, and while it's new leg legislation, it really enhances um, structures and builds on what's already in place and actually is a natural extension of the internal audit commission relationship. Uh, ODOT has had an active internal audit function for many years. In 2001, a formal engagement with the commission began with the reestablishment of an audit committee that included a commission representative. Commissioner Randy Pape was our first member and we have had a continued commission presence ever since and uh, Commissioner Brown is our current representative. Um, and so I would like to share the audit committee uh, uh, supports our internal audit role in many ways in providing an independent look at department programs. We accomplished this through developing a risk-based plan of audits, uh, performing the audits, and then following up to uh, assess corrective actions taken to address the audit findings. An overarching and crucial component of our audit process is that um, there's a solid foundation uh, for our independence. In addition to the support of the committee, we have established numerous safeguards uh, in this regard. First, we conduct our audits in accordance with government auditing standards. These are issued by the U.S. Government Accountability Office. They set the bar high for independence and objectivity. We have to attest both individually and as an organization that we are free of impairments. We also have to be scrutinized by our national peers to make sure we have appropriate accountabilities in place. Secondly, we have unrestricted access to all records and personnel. This is established in ODA policy. Bottom line, if we need it for our work, we have authority to get it. We also call it like we see it. The audit process is protected from undue influence, both through internal structures we have in place from our standards following efforts. We have statutory protections, and we also have access to those charged with governance. Fourth, we also share the work uh, with our outside oversight officials. Uh, uh, this includes both the Transportation Commission, uh, Federal Highway, and also uh, the Secretary of State Audits Division. And finally, last but not least, we have the final say on what we audit. First by policy and now by statute, the internal auditor has final authority. 
As the governing body, the Transportation Commission has had an ongoing role in our audit process. In addition to the long-standing involvement with the Audit Committee, the Commission members have had input into our audit plan. Previously, input had been sought by one or two members. Now it is the full Commission. Uh, the Commission previously received copies of our audit reports. Now they are formally accepted on the consent calendar. In addition to these enhancements, we have expanded the engagement with the Commission to include Commission requested audits and then formal adoption of our work plan. And we look forward to continued dialogue with the Commission. We have our proposed internal audit work plan for 2018-19 uh, to share with you in the very near future. We appreciate the engagement of the Commission as audit reports are released and also continued attention as management actions are taken on the audit findings. Um, we also um, appreciate uh, the responsibility we have to be the independent voice and provide the unbiased perspective. It is, it is both an honor and a privilege to have that role and one that we take seriously. We thank you for your continued commitment and support in us in this function. Uh, thank you for, for your report. Just uh, to clarify, who do you report to? Chair Bainey, uh, Commissioner O'Halloran. Uh, currently, we report to the director. Uh, previously, we had reported to the uh, Central Services Administrator, uh, which is essentially the deputy head of the organization. And in accordance with our auditing standards, organizationally, we are independent if we report to the head, the deputy head, or those charged with governance. So, I, and, and I defer to Commissioner Brown on this, but I think one of the things that I think the legislature and others uh, look to us to assure is an element of independence in the role that you play and having latitude to audit uh, everything. Absolutely. And I and I think that for the things that we see that you're auditing, we can see credibility in it, but I think um, we don't know what's not being audited. Um, but I think it's something that we need to look at in terms of accountability is does the reporting structure um, give you latitude free of coercion or any element of that um, if you were to, re to audit something that under the director's purview would we have public credibility um, in the independence of your work mm -hmm. and I think it's just something we need to be sensitive to um, and uh, making sure that you're truly independent mm -hmm. in, in the role that you're playing. And Commissioner Brown, I just, I, uh, I, I leave it to you in, in the role that you're playing and kind of how that plays out. But it's more a comment than a question. Absolutely. Hi, Marlene. Uh, and to follow up on Commissioner O'Halloran, I think you have a very aggressive uh, outlook as we look at your plan for 1819. I know you'll bring that to us for approvals. Um, as we look for your independence, we need you to report back to us, and we need you to tell us with some of the aggressiveness that you're, you've got quite a few things on your plate, probably more that will be added as time goes along. If you need something, if you need more time, if you need more help, we need to make sure that we understand that as well. Uh, and the independence, I think, is vital uh, in an internal auditor. Uh, I have appreciated what Director Garrett has tells you at every meeting to be that independent voice, uh, and we need to make sure that we believe that too and have all of the commissioners understand and believe that that's truly how you feel. And I would ask you directly to reach out to all of us or one of us mm -hmm. if you feel that that's being jeopardized Absolutely. at any time. Absolutely. So thank you. That is the elevation of this position, is that the OTC is now officially elevating this position of appointing an, in, uh, an independent auditor that will work at the direction of the, of, uh, in consultation with the director, but also we do that together in populating that work plan mm -hmm. and ident identifying workflows that we want to see. Uh, of course, you have the discretion to let us know whether that's duplicative or if mm -hmm. there's another way of looking at it um, with your professional standards. But I think what I'd really like to strengthen as well is that follow-up piece, those findings and uh, ways in which we can formalize mm -hmm. uh, you know, many audits don't have findings, but that's the continuous improvement piece of always uh, making sure that we're following up on those pieces that do uh, rise to um, that level. So how we formalize that, I think, will be something that we'll look at in the future. 
So any other comments or questions? Uh, I will, oh, please, Dr. Garrett. No, I'll allow you to finish, Madam Chair. There's a second part to this item, and that's designating the ODOT audit, but I'll allow you to conclude, then I'll share some thoughts. Well, I, I just wanted to personally say that this is an, uh, in a unique situation where we have a very qualified individual who we've worked well with. Uh, and so I just want to put on the record that I feel very comfortable with the process in which we have used. Uh, having looked at her credentials and having had a chance to talk with Marlene and uh, discuss process and her thoughts and how she approaches work, I think that uh, she is uh, uniquely uh, skilled and the right person for us to take this on right now. We will, as mentioned uh, previously, we will have an opportunity to designate a process for in the future, uh, knowing that none of us will always be here. Uh, so we will streamline that and make sure that that um, is in place as well. But I feel quite comfortable. I know that uh, something on top of my mind has been procurement and contracting, project delivery, some of those elements that we hear about. Uh, she's been very open to uh, putting together scope of work that will meet our needs as well. So it feels very iterative. So, Director, please. Madam Chair, I don't, I, you very eloquent, um, eloquently said, I don't think I can say it better, but I think I have to, to make sure that we are uh, um, comporting with Section 15 of House Bill 20, uh, 2017. There's little question that Ms. Hartinger's bona fide speaks for themselves. There's no question. She's a person of intellect, of integrity, and I would submit independence. That's the way she runs the audit shop. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's no misunderstanding that. She ensures that we complement the discipline of the audit tool here at the agency with that of engaging the legislature, engaging the commission, engaging the Secretary of State's office, as well as our federal partners at Highway and Transit who, uh, who have audit oversight and discipline applied uh, as well. Uh, she is a woman who is recognized not only here in the state of Oregon, but she is rec recognized nat nationally. And as you said, Madam Chair, I think the, the qualities that we have in Marlene Hottinger makes it easy for me to, um, uh, to recommend to the Commission that we designate her the, uh, the ODOT auditor. And as you said, Madam Chair, uh, and then as the years go by, there will be a process for someone to, to follow Ms. Hartinger and we have uh, shared a process to ensure we're using the right criteria, uh, thus ensuring we get the, the qualified candidate that can, uh, again, carry on in an independent um, and uh, with integrity and honor and using that business tool to make this organization a better organization. So with that, I would ask Marlene be designated ODOT's internal auditor. Okay. I would welcome a motion. I uh, move to approve Marlene Hartinger as our internal auditor. Okay. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Congratulations and Thank you. lucky us. Great. Thank you so, very much. Thank you. So it's a new day in Oregon with House Bill 2017, and I'd like to call up Ms. Horner, Ms. Silva, and uh, we have a lot of work underway. Uh, first and foremost, we have uh, Ms. Silva, who is our project manager for implementation, which I think is not going to be an easy uh, lift, but the right person to do this work. Uh, we have now run through, so appointing the uh, independent auditor. We have the value pricing committee that is starting on Monday. We have the stiff committee that's starting next week as well. We have uh, Lynn here helping us on staffing. Is, uh, we have a lot of pieces that are happening. Uh, Connect Oregon process moving forward with uh, projects coming December 15th with a deadline. So a lot of work going on. So please let us know where we are. And uh, for commission members, in your supplemental packet, there are some materials for your review as well. So please, Ms. Horner, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Good morning, Chair Bainey and members of the commission. Um, Leah Horner, Government Relations for the Department. Um, I feel like I have a ton of stuff to share with you this morning. Um, there are two main pieces that I'm going to try to get through in the next hour. Um, the first is kind of a follow-up to the discussion that was had last month at the workshop and kind of um, honing in a little bit more on the implementation pieces um, that are designated, for lack of a better term, as the commission shall. Um, so I'd like to walk through that a little bit more um, along with Kat. And the second piece is the um, technical fix conversation that the Joint Committee had earlier this week. Um, we also have a document in the supplemental um, information that kind of walks through what those are um, and kind of what we are uh, 
asking for in that vein. So um, to those behind me, there are the documents that we're walking through are in the back of the room right now. So uh, they may not have been there earlier, but they are there now if anybody wants to kind of follow along. So with that, I'm going to start with this document, um, the one with uh, the yellow and blue headers on it. Um, I think what, what we brought forward to you all uh, last month was kind of how we had identified the implementation work for us as an agency. What we were able to do is hone it into 42 initiatives um, under both House Bill 2017 as well as House Bill 5045, which is the accompanying budget bill. What we brought forward last month was the 18, the commission shall um, statements, if you will, throughout the bill. Um, and what this um, work plan overview does is it breaks down a little bit more in detail what those 18 um, sections do. And then I think what we would kind of ask is, as we're putting together our implementation plans, the proposed implementation strategy is on the right-hand column. But I think this is kind of our opportunity to ask you all if that strategy works, if there are elements in here that the commission would like to lean into more, because we can absolutely um, configure that into how our implementation strategy is taking place. Um, so having said that, I'd like to go through all 18, um, and I'll try to make this as painless as possible. Um, feel free to um, kind of stop me if there are questions or if there is a strong feeling one way or the other about how much each of you would like to lean into something. I, I, I would like to kind of frame this more as a dialogue, I guess, than just my talking to you, but I'm happy to just talk to you as well. So um, with that, I think we'll start with... Um, the first one, which is the modification of duties and authority um, and purpose. So these are sections 2, 5, 19, and 20. Um, and these are really the sections, if you'll recall, that modified the um, appointment of the director. It um, gave the chair the ability to appoint a vice chair. Um, so it really is kind of the, the duties of the commission, as well as the opportunity for you all to identify the staff needed um, to support you all and the ability to go out and hire that staff. Um, so let's see. Um, so, um, and th this one I think is one that uh, there's been conversations thus far that I believe that this is one that the, and I don't want to speak for you all, that the commission is very interested in leaning into significantly. That is a fair statement. Okay. And I think this is not a one and done either. I think it'll be continuous in terms of what we need to be able to implement uh, the responsibilities in House Bill 2017. So uh, we may want to, I don't know if we want to spend, <laughs> because I, I think this almost lends itself to a work session for us to be able to really look at what's been delegated at this point, look at what we want to be. Uh, um, maybe not delegating in the future or things that we do not delegate today that we may want to delegate in the future. So I, I just would look to the commission members in terms of, I think there's a, a bit more information that we would need to dive too deep into this at this point, but uh, certainly something that um, December, I, as we're structuring the agenda, I think something that's a bit more iterative and not quite so formal, we can dive into that a little easier. So thoughts? Uh, Madam Chair, I, I think it's, might be worth uh, mentioning when uh, the joint committee chairs are here. Some of these things don't have a timeline, but I think there's uh, there is an expectation that we move forward on some of it. So yes. I just think some clarity from them might be might be helpful, and and some of them are effective immediately. Like I believe uh, um, reporting structure and a couple of those other things that I think took effect um, with the bill. But I think just just some clarity that some of them aren't aren't linked to a timeline, but I do think there's an expectation that we act. Okay, and I certainly uh, do not disagree. I really am excited to have that conversation with the co-chairs so that we can understand communication. I think that will be critical to our success. 
but uh, things such as now the director reports to the commission. So performance, how does that work? How, you know, we just have some detailed pieces of just operating slightly differently that I want to make sure that we out of the, um, to be holistic to this work, we set a foundation that is uh, structured for the future, uh, not something that is uh, lacks clarity as we go forward. So uh, Leah, I'll turn it to you for further discussion. I think that's helpful. And, and to Commissioner O'Halloran's um, point about no statutory deadline on there, one of the things we've tried to identify on here as well as proposed timelines for implementation. So this, uh, acknowledging exactly what you just said is something that we are trying to lean into sooner rather than later to make sure that it's not only addressed at the forefront, but also it is an ongoing um, uh, component. So um, moving on to uh, section 10, the continuous improvement advisory committee. Um, so the bill gave the commission the authority to appoint the continuous improvement advisory committee. Um, and then for them to advise on uh, really maximizing the efficiencies within the agencies and developing KPMs that would then come back to the commission. Um, and so there's a requirement in there to report uh, fairly regularly both to the commission as well as to the joint committee. Um, and again, the, the timeline on this is something that we, I think, are, are leaning into uh, fairly aggressively, but also would um, seek that the commission has significant engagement in how this uh, component moves forward. And on this one in particular, I think there is a question, at least for myself as chair of the commission, about role clarity and uh, communication between the legislature. Uh, it effectively states that if we do not implement the, uh, re the recommendations from the committee, that uh, we would not be able to move forward with an additional uh, increase in the gas tax. So if, if that was the intent or if that, uh, there could be reasons that the commission itself would, that advisory piece is critical, uh, the recommendations will be important, but there may be a reason that we wouldn't implement something. So how, how that works, the mechanics of it, uh, is something that I'd like to uh, flesh out a little bit better with the legislature. Absolutely, and Madam Chair, that is on our technical fix list, asking for clarification. Um, and just so folks can track it appropriately, that's the trigger is tied in Section 45. It's the second trigger that identifies that if the commission is not implementing a, a recommendation coming from the CIAC six months prior, that the trigger um, to increase the gas tax would not be um, able to move forward. So that is on our list to absolutely seek clarification on. Beneficial is that in these, so for the Continuous Improvement Advisory Committee, there is a role for the commission at, to sit on this committee as well. So if you don't mind noting that, so that for commission members, as I will be reaching out and asking where you'd like to uh, take an interest, uh, this is that process to uh, spark that interest. <laughs> Please. Uh, I, I, Madam Chair, I think that's well said. Um, for the commission to know, we are coming back next month and actually doing a little bit deeper dive specific to the, the Continuous Improvement Advisory Committee. The composition, the construct, the, the, the types of um, skill sets that would populate that, which includes the, uh, the professionals um, um, uh, in, in specific areas as well as uh, ODOT professionals as well as commissioners. Related to the earlier conversation with regard to audit, that becomes a significant tool, I believe, for the Continuous Improvement Advisory Committee, and somehow integrating those conversations to optimize and maximize the, uh, the resources that advisory committee has is important to us. We'll drill down a little deeper next month as we bring that specific issue before the Commission. Great. So uh, moving on to uh, the internal auditor. Um, I think the timing on this is uh, appropriate. So uh, Marlene uh, just did a great job. And I think Section 15 um, just kind of clarifies the, the role of the auditor. It made some shift in the reporting. Um, but And I think as noted, um, it also gives the commission the authority to um, really direct the audits and the audit plans and to make sure that um, the right audits are being engaged in and that the follow-up um, is also uh, being done on those. So 
um, I think this is just kind of piggybacking um, on the conversation that you all just had with her. So. Um, Let's see, section 120 is the value pricing. Um, I think that you all are uh, very much uh, engaged in this already, and I think that that um, is actually one of the roles that um, is um, helpful from my perspective, at least, um, having an OTC representative, um, at least one on the um, advisory committee to kind of help guide that work to make sure that we're engaging appropriately. So. Um, this is one of the, I think, the biggest pieces that the commission um, is leaning in on at this point. We chose to take the path of two commission members, and that committee meeting begins on Monday. So uh, that'll be an important discussion for the community. So the cost completion um, study is a requirement um, that has two deadlines in it, uh, both in February of 18 and February of 2020, for um, us to identify the cost to complete both the I-205 Abernathy Bridge and widening, as well as the I-5 uh, Rose Quarter. Um, so the proposed implementation strategy at this point is that um, we will be working on the cost completion work and we'll be bringing that back to the commission for review. Um, That'll be completed by February 1st. Yes, that is our goal. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, let's see, so section 71D is the section that identifies all of the projects um, through House Bill 2017. Um, there is a provision in there that identifies um, that the commission will determine the order of completion. I think we have spoken previously about the letter that came from the Joint Committee members that also um, kind of identified how the timeline for each of those things should work. So I think in collaboration with that is how um, we're uh, developing and working on our implementation plan as well as drafting templates that are um, currently being negotiated for each one of, of those pieces. Um, our plan right now is to bring back um, uh, project updates to you all to make sure that we are um, hitting the, the timelines on completion for each of the projects that have been identified through the bill. Are we hearing from any of the regions on those projects that um, they want adjustments to the projects at all? Is that something that we would track too? meaning if the project wasn't maybe exactly the right one today, but it was made the list? We have been hearing questions from some of the regions. There are some um, projects that are identified that are, are you know, a, a bike pet project in, you know, in, in a city that's been identified. So we have had some back and forth about what allowable expenses might look like um, and making sure that they're actually hitting the target on that. So um, the regions have been communicating with the recipients of the funds um, and we are developing um, a standard kind of um, template to enter into agreements, uh, making sure that uh, we're handling all of them the same way, but that they are also hitting the intent. Um, so the next couple of sections um, are around uh, Connect Oregon, um, and I think the, the main shift in this is that there have been a handful of earmarked uh, projects coming out of this bill. There's four, and I believe that you all have already leaned into the rules um, around the pre-proposal um, process that will be coming forward um, the middle of December. Um, so that's the, the main shift at this point that we have been working on um, is those proposals and the rules around the four. Um, the uh, plans will be coming back to you all for review and approval. Um, 
And within Connect Oregon, those projects aside, there has also been a designation of projects of statewide significance. There's been a division of uh, Connect Oregon 1 versus a Connect Oregon 2. So all of those um, rules and approval processes will also come back to the commission similar in, I think through our implementation strategy, similar to how we've done Connect Oregon in the past, but with the modifications in adherence to the statutory changes um, that the um, shift in the larger projects and the definitions of projects um, coming out of the bill um, will be. This is all contingent on funds being available in the Connect Oregon fund at this point. Um, our uh, interpretation at this point is that we will be um, expending dollars first on the four, first on the four earmarked projects, and then as money comes in through the privilege tax or other um, revenue streams, that uh, those will come forward as well. But I think there's a, a little bit of time on those as we figure out the path uh, of the funding sources. And then all of that is coupled with the streamlining work that we had done as well that was previous to uh, the completion of the package? It is. I believe the streamlining report, I want to say it's at section 85. I'm jumping ahead, sorry. Um, no, it's OK. okay. Yes. But the streamlining report is actually something that you all approved a, a couple of months ago. <laughs> and really what that section was identifying is how could we, once we receive applications, receive the applications a little bit better and do um, a little bit more of a streamlining paperwork process, if you will, on our end to be less onerous for the applicants. So um, all of that will come back into play on that. And we've also been requested by the Joint Committee to come back in January to report on that streamlining report. Um, yes. These commission members, if there are questions or comments, just um, this is for you. So um, let's see, section 75 um, is the user fee study and House Bill 2017 identifies that the OTC shall conduct a study to identify the proportionate share of users um, using vehicles powered by different means and how much they should be paying. Um, the commission is, is um, required to report to the Joint Committee on September 15th of 2023. Um, but as you'll note on our proposed implementation strategy, um, we're working to develop the scope of the gap analysis and execute an IGA with the Department of Administrative Services to help with this um, study, at which we will then at that point bring back to you for review. And some of these, noting the deadline, we were able to, it right. seems like, <laughs> if we were able to get that done sooner, that would not be a bad thing. So it, uh, is that your chuckle? <laughs> so I know there's a lot of work in here, but I, I don't want the um, public to think that we're just bound by that and we're going to back into it. I think that this is a, that's a, um, something that would be the not to exceed. Certainly, if we can get there sooner, that'd be great. Well, do, do we have like uh, benchmark updates and reports within that time frame that have, haven't obviously been identified yet, I'm assuming, unless, is it a quarterly, is it biannually? Madam Chair, Commissioner Simpson, I think that's probably the work of Ms. Silva here, where we will capture the evolution of each of these initiatives, and we will bring that documentation back to you and share. So uh, each kind of has its own timeline, but we're comprehensive. We have, a, um, again, a pretty good handle on all the activities and the, the timelines and the sequencing of these activities and work that Ms. Silva can bring forth. So, Kat, if you want to drill down into that, please do. Sorry, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, yes, that is exactly what we're kind of working on right now. As part of the IGA, I would imagine that, well, I don't imagine. I know we will be uh, working with um, or working through identifying what those required kind of benchmark reporting pieces would be. And then we bring that back to you for approval to make sure that that meets your needs and, and what your expectations are. And um, you know, if the timeline is t is longer than what you would anticipate or or would desire, I think we could also probably negotiate that as well. Excellent. Good. Okay. 
Thank you. Hmm? So moving on to the winter maintenance strategy um, in sections 136 and 137, this actually I think is an example of one that we're not required to bring back until February of 2019. However, knowing that you know winter is upon us, um, we are um, leaning into this around what our uh, current winter maintenance strategy is. I believe there will be a presentation to you all uh, uh, with a draft report at least next month. And we're also engaging our sister agencies that have um, impacts on how we approach the strategy as well, such as um, Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Department of Environmental Quality. So um, those are pieces of work that we are engaged in. Um, right now, and as I indicated, we'll be bringing back those draft strategies for you all to review and approve. And my, I expect that there will be more than just one. Mm -hmm. um, section 122. I think um, every every room that I'm in, there's kind of a big uh, big gasp of air about Section 122 in its entirety. <laughs> um, <clears throat> The State Transportation Improvement Fund, which is the um, massive new investment in um, transit, I think is, is one that everybody is paying very close attention to. Uh, Mr. Gard has been before you um, over the last couple of months to uh, get direction on standing up his rule advisory committee. Um, and I think the expectation is that uh, the rules will be coming back to you um, and we will kind of be uh, for lack of a better term, bringing you along at every every step of the way to make sure that this one is being implemented um, appropriately. There are a number of uh, kind of external factors that play into this. The revenue collection that's coming to us from the Department of Revenue is a brand new one. Um, and we're working with them to ensure that there will be sufficient compliance coming from um, the folks who will be paying this payroll tax. So I think there, what we're looking at right now is probably a little bit of a delay as to when we will actually see revenue to distribute. Um, but we're working very hard to make sure once that there is revenue that we will um, have our processes in place to make sure that we are hitting the targets of the distribution of funds of the Technical Resource Center and of our administrative staff to um, ensure compliance with this. And uh, the revenue will begin to be collected July of 18, is that yes. correct? So we, although it states no statutory deadline, we kind of have a deadline of, of sorts. So uh, certainly something that we want to be mindful of. And I know that the Rules Advisory Committee is mindful of that too. So uh, certainly a lot of preparation being done right now. Um, Chair Beeney, we also have, um, we also have uh, an operative date in the bill as well as of January 1 of 2019. So we're, we're cognizant of kind of those two dates and, and, and the implementation plan, I believe, kind of works around that. So section nine um, requires the commission to compile and keep a real property inventory to assure that any excess property that um, ODOT has and may not be completely utilizing then comes forward um, to the commission to review uh, periodically uh, what potential other uses for those um, properties could be. Um, so um, as you'll note in our implementation component, we're working with the Department of State Lands and GIS to um, continually uh, develop and update this inventory that we will uh, bring forward to you all to review. Uh, how, how detailed will that inventory be? What, what will it all outline? Just not only obviously parcels, but what other information will be identified in that list? So the bill requires it to have a description of uh, the uh, parcel of land, um, identification of possible use, um, identification of any future plans that ODOT may have for that parcel, as well as the value. So at this point in time, those are the um, statutory requirements that we will be identifying through that. Section uh, 123 is the safe routes to school. And again, this one was also brought before you a couple of months ago because they also are standing up a rule advisory committee to help um, identify um, 
the program design and uh, awards of funds to the, um, the program as identified through the bill. So um, I expect the rules to come back to, to you all for review and approval, um, as well as the, their plan to move forward. This may be more of a technical question, but we've heard a lot about uh, leveraging funds and there, the education outreach and safety components of this funding uh, stream as well as others that we have, is that something that will be a discussion point as well so that we can make sure that we're maximizing and leveraging that as best as possible? Uh, Chair Bainey and Commissioners, yes, that is something that is um, part of the work effort and I, I, I believe I make reference to it but maybe not, uh, maybe not very specifically in the high level deliverables. It's, it's a part of the focus is to make sure that we're aligning those. Section 12 is the project tracking website, um, and the bill actually identifies that the commission through ODOT shall develop a website. Um, and this was really getting at these uh, list of STIP projects to make sure that available to the general public and anybody else who is um, interested that we meet a number of criteria to make sure that um, uh, people understand kind of what we're engaged in out, out on the roads. Um, so our plan at this point is to um, bring back a plan to you all uh, for input and feedback to make sure that the project tracking um, website is hitting the targets that um, I think everybody would find um, meeting the need. So section 11 um, requires the commission to develop uniform standards um, with the city and county for consistent description and reporting of the condition of pavement and bridges. Um, and so this is a, a conversation that we are working very closely right now with both the Association of Oregon Counties and um, the League of Oregon Cities on to make sure that once we have that we are all on the same page about what that uniform standard looks like. Um, uh, our plan right now is to bring back to you what that standard is um, in early of 2018 um, for your review and approval to make sure that, again, we're hitting the mark on what that uniform standard is. Um, and this also is one of the ones that has a reporting requirement back to the Joint Committee. And also a, a technical support as well for the smaller areas that this would be new to? Is that a component that we're working on as, uh, with our city and county partners if they need support for reporting? Chair Rainey and Commissioners, uh, yes, uh, that is actually a separate um, initiative underneath the, uh, the House bill. I believe it's uh, Section 74, if I'm, if I'm not um, speaking out of turn. I can double check that, though. Um, and that's, that just um, identifies the, the technical assistance services that we would provide. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so section 45 is the one that uh, I think we made mention to a little bit earlier. Um, this is the section that has the conditional increase accountability reports and this is really the section that deals with all of the triggers. So there is a list of deliverables that, um, that we must meet and then the commission must submit in order to um, engage the two cent triggers um, that uh, occur every couple of years. Um, so this is uh, one that we intend to very regularly update you all on and make sure that we um, uh, have all the condition requirements that we need. Uh, we'll be submitting a draft uh, report to you to make to identify all of the components that are required. Um, obviously, if there are issues beforehand, we'll bring those forward uh, sooner rather than later. The section six is the statewide modal plans, and um, I believe you all had some conversation about that in the um, workshop last month. Um, I think that there are a number of modal plans that we as an agency engage in at this point. There was a little bit of expansion in this bill to aviation uh, and marine. 
Um, and so I think that we are, it's on our list of technical fixes to seek some clarification around what the development and the maintenance of a 20 year modal plan for modes that are not technically under the purview of us as an agency or you as a commission would look like. Um, you'll note on our technical fix list, one of the components that we've brought up is that this is, those, those additional modes are not state highway fund eligible. Um, however, we have had conversations with the other agencies that are impacted who very much want to coordinate and try to figure out what an integrated overarching transportation plan would look like with their components um, in, embedded into that. So I think we continue to have conversations as, and as I indicated, we're seeking clarification through the technical fix conversation as well. I, we haven't had an opportunity to have a uh, deep discussion about that, but it does seem from a, you know, it's no different than someone driving on a road, really doesn't care if it's a state or a county or a city. Uh, those operating within Oregon, our economy doesn't really care whether it's under the purview of the Department of Transportation or aviation or ports or whatnot. The system needs to work. And so the more that we can coordinate and align ourselves to leverage those um, funds and support one another and add continuity within that system, I think we, we all benefit. I think, Madam Chair, if I may, I completely concur with that. It also, I think, necessitates not only alignment between the agencies, but um, engagement and integration of a conversation between the, the various boards. So the, the, the Aviation Commission would come forward, Business Oregon and their board or commission would come forward, and those interactions between the Oregon Transportation Commission to ensure that, again, we are comprehensive and holistic in a transportation discussion but respecting the uniqueness and the disciplines and the color of money issue that uh, Leah ar articulated a little a few moments ago. Um, I think there's a great opportunity to uh, improve and enhance the dialogue of all the transportation interests um, under a big umbrella. Great. Uh, section 14, House Bill 2017 made a couple of modifications to the STIP selection criteria. Um, and so this will be updated in advance of the 2022-24 STIP, and this will also be brought forward to you all as we um, engage a little bit further in that. Um, let's see. And then Section 85, um, we already talked about that report. Um, I consider it um, just about done, but we'll continue reporting and making sure that we're adhering to the recommendations that are coming out of that as we move forward with Connect Oregon. Um, so, so basically, um, what we've gone through just now is all of the, the heavy commission shells coming out of House Bill 2017. Granted, the authority of the commission is much broader than just these pieces, but these are the ones that have been identified and do create a little bit of shift in, in operations. Um, so I would um, propose that the proposed implementation strategy is, is continues to be up for discussion. <laughs> Um, but also that that is kind of the path that we have identified as an agency um, and uh, would uh, encourage further um, conversations on those pieces. One discussion that we had at our workshop last month was the population of a, of a dashboard, a, a tracking mechanism for us to know how we are doing and, and where things are working well and they're not. That was also on project delivery, some other components as well. But would you, would either of you like to just uh, do a brief overview of kind of how we would put this and populate it into a dashboard for us to be able to monitor as we go forward? Uh, Chair Rainey and Commissioners, so um, there we do have a current dashboard for all 42 initiatives, and um, I am currently working on creating basically a slimmed down version for the commission so that we can look at both the 42, you can see the agency's overall progress there, but then you can kind of drill down into each one of the um, initiatives under your purview, well, uh, uh, that are statutorily uh, your responsibility, and then also um, see the timelines where we're at, you know, what percentage we are complete to date in our performance on budget to actuals. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I think in going through this, um, legislature made it clear that, that they are granting a lot of new authority and um, to the commission. Um, one of the things they also uh, added was the ability to staff at the commission level. 
Um, and I appreciate and recognize the fact that a lot of good work is being done here. But um, they deliberately said the commission shall versus ODOT shall. And I think um, we may want to have an ongoing discussion about what that means and, and do we need to have an OTC person staffed up to help execute and implement this um, or are we um, by default uh, taking things where the legislature said OTC shall and giving them to ODOT to execute. And I understand that there is a lot of, ODOT will have to execute much of, of this, but it should come at our direction. So I, I again, I'm, I'm stating this as a comment and maybe a mild concern that this may be the opportunity to look at that role and how we'd utilize it and how we'd have someone play a role that would serve as an overarching commission um, implementer, executor, and, and, and to figure out wh where that goes. But I, I think it's just, I want to be mindful and maybe um, when the committee's up here, we, we could seek clarity on that. But it, it is apparent to me that there's, th these are new, most of these are new authorities that were put in 2017. Um, there's still a lot of OTC may <laughs> versus shall, and, um, and this is on top of existing authority. So I, I just want to make sure that we're looking at, um, are we doing this the best way, um, and is there a role there for someone, and, and again, I'm not uh, anxious to spend funds to um, uh, add headcount, mm -hmm. um, but um, are we executing uh, the letter and the intent of the law? Okay. Commissioner, please. Thing to it operate. Yeah. It needs a little gas or something, <laughs> oil. Um, so I, I'd echo uh, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner O'Halloran's comments. I think, well, first of all, this is obviously a massive, <laughs> massive undertaking. Uh, and my observations on it are, and first, compliments to the, the governor and the legislature for, for pushing this through. Uh, it's important to the state's future, and um, we're, on, we're on point on it uh, to some degree. So a couple of things. One is uh, we had this new authority, and the question, one question is how do we properly execute it, and what kind of advice do we need from those who are experienced in executing this kind of authority uh, and this expansive and far-reaching of an effort that will then lead un undoubtedly and form the basis of the next step whenever that occurs because this is this is a this is a problem that uh, deferred maintenance and challenges and growth and a whole range of things going on um, that has led to um, a moment of urgency with respect to transportation uh, investment. So uh, that may be in the form of staff, that might be in the form of consultants, it might be in the form of some other expertise that we bring to the table that we're doing cooperatively with the department, but also bringing in some independent or uh, additional expertise that would benefit both the commission and the department. Uh, that, that's one comment. Uh, the second comment is a comment followed by a question, and that is, uh, as I look at this, um, it's an enormous undertaking that's going to require a great deal of delegation and reporting and communication. And we've already, in the course of this discussion this morning, talked about it in terms of intergovernmental cooperation, interdepartmental cooperation, cooperation between the commission, uh, communication between... Uh, the Joint Committee and the Legislature and the Governor and all of the interests in state government and local government and the federal government. Uh, and then, of course, the, there's the whole external communication piece, which is huge in terms of um, the public. We're, we're in an expectations game here to some degree, I believe, 
there are lots of people that have lots of expectations about what this is going to mean. And um, I think we need to have a conversation at some point, and maybe you've had it. So if all of this is redundant, sorry. Uh, but uh, if we need a conversation soon about uh, what are the expectations, ideally we would exceed expectations. So we have to set them responsibly so we have the opportunity to do that. And then what is the communication strategy for ensuring that we are communicating actively and clearly and regularly to all of the different constituencies involved here so that they understand what we're doing? Because we could be doing it very well, and if no one knows what we're doing, I guarantee you we'll have problems. So that's my opening comment. I think communication and expectation and delegation are three words that are just screaming at me this morning, and we need to have um, we need to have a very clear and a convincing strategy on that, and that may involve some staff or ad additional um, outside expertise and support. And my question is, do we have a comprehensive strategy for communication? We have the website noted in here out of the bill. We have different pieces of it, but do we have a comprehensive strategy for ensuring that we are communicating in the way we need to? Uh, not only do we not only need to get the work done on time or and on budget or ahead of time, we also need to be communicating actively and regularly. So I'm just curious what what is what is the state of affairs with respect to communicating to all those constituencies I mentioned and others that I have forgotten to mention. Thank you. Well, I just want to comment that I think your observations are spot on, and I um, appreciate the fact that you've been tracking and following this process and can hit the ground running today. So I, I think it's a great, great question. So please. Uh, Commissioner, I think that's a fantastic question, and I will say that that actually is something that we have identified as a gap. Um, I think that we are understanding that we do need to have um, consistent uh, communication. But as you indicated, there are a multitude of constituencies that need to have that communication. And I, you know, just as an example, we have engaged with all of our sister agencies, um, but now we need to figure out how to uh, have that continual communication um, on those multitude of levels. So it is something that we've identified and are working to address. Madam Chair, if I may, just to, to continue on Ms. Horner's point, you're going to hear a little bit later this afternoon from Tom Fuller about a communication approach. I'm going to hear a little bit later in our conversation specific to the strategic business plan uh, and the disciplines of how we communicate to, again, the many masters that transportation serves. So it is a, uh, it, uh, we're working to ensure confluence. Um, and ensuring, to your point, that we are touching all the points we need to touch to share when we do well, um, or in those cases where we may stumble, because we have to communicate that as well. So. Okay. Just real quick, and not to belabor this point, but I appreciate your comments about communication. I think one of the things that we've discussed in the past, and we'll see a little bit later this morning, is that link with the Joint Transportation Commission and or committee, I guess. Uh, but really, legislative intent was very clear. Mm -hmm. The thou shalt is because of lack of trust. And it's our role to garner that trust mm -hmm. for Oregonians. Yes, love the legislators themselves, but truly we're doing this for Oregonians and making sure that the message that we relay Communication has so many different levels, and Tom Fuller's done a, a great job, but those layers aren't just internal to the organization, and they're not just external to the legislators. It's really how do we share what we're doing and why. And I think that, to me, it was very clear. There's mistrust. Mistrust, perhaps, of the organization. Mistrust of us in helping to set policy for the organization but that is very clear in the thou shalts. And I'm not yet confident that we're gonna get there. Uh, and I, I guess that, that worries me a little bit. I think we have a lot of things and we've scrubbed the list pretty well. Okay, what's that execution step? 
How are we going to make that happen? And what is our role in making sure that happens? Right now, we are relying solely on internal ODOT employees. So how do we do that for Oregon? Yeah, I businesses and uh, that this was all for a good reason. So I appreciate you bringing that up. And one thing that I, I want to say to the commission members is that we talked about it at our workshop uh, last month. I think the opportunity for us to get into a work session again and really mine through some of this, well, this is a great process. It is, it is clunky to be able to really deeply dive into the nuances that are within this and establish that foundation in a way that's meaningful. So I am looking at December to do that. Time is really of the essence. And so um, Director Garrett will work offline to create that space. But uh, I know for some it's, well, is that public? Yes, it is. Will it be this formal? No, it won't. Uh, it can't be. We really need to determine what it is that uh, the commission will need to be able to execute so that we can support the agency and get that clarity for Oregonians as well. So just kind of a commentary, but just so that you know what's being prepped. So please, other comments? Do. Are we doing this now? I believe that we are. Leah is yes. next. Right. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> so Great. we will um, walk through this quickly. <laughs> um, so the uh, first section is um, technical fixes or policy. So, okay, let me take a step back. There, in the technical fix conversation, um, there are there were pieces that were identified that just kind of came forward as a quote unquote technical fix. However, when you look at what is truly a technical fix versus what is teetering on policy, it became clear that there was a gray area there. So what we've tried to identify through this document it are um, technical fixes, realizing that some of them may wear the hat of a policy change. Um, so the first section is really identifying the suggestions that we have brought forward to the Joint Committee that teeter on that policy change. Um, so the first one is Section 2, the fiduciary responsibilities. There is a clause in Section 2 that identifies an indirect fiduciary responsibility. Um, we're working to clarify how broad that term actually um, can be defined as. There's no current definition for that, and that um, could be seen as incredibly broad. So we're asking for some clarification on, on what that means as a true conflict. Um, Section six, I think we already um, talked about kind of the long range plans. Um, we've asked for some clarification on what that means as well as um, some questions around the funding source. Um, should it truly be worth that's coming out of this agency? Um, section 14 and section 80, there were provisions in both of these sections uh, requiring that criteria to project selection for STIP and Connect Oregon projects um, identify how um, close projects are to a local aggregate source, um, which for us is a little bit awkward in the project selection um, component. Um, so we are engaging in additional conversations about what that, um, what that means and what the actual implications or benefit to adding that as a criteria for the selection process um, would be. Um, Section 45, we also talked a little bit about this, um, making sure that uh, there are a couple of provisions in the um, triggers, if you will, for the fuel tax increases that are slightly outside of the purview of the commission. It's requiring the commission to ensure that other entities are um, submitting their plans appropriately, which is slightly outside of the role. So if that is not being met, would then the commission be held accountable for that in action, if you will. So that is one piece that we're seeking clarification on, as well as the, um, the time frame around that second trigger that we discussed, um, making sure that we were still adhering to that if a recommendation had come up prior um, to actual implementation being um, met for the timeline. So those two pieces are in section 45. 
Section 71 A and B, um, I think this is a conversation that we um, had had uh, previously. Our original, um, if you will, talking point around the distribution of funds were consistently consistent with what you all had put forward in the investment strategy. So um, that is, again, what we are asking for in this percentage breakdown, which does differ from what's in the current bill. But because it's consistent with the investment strategy, it is the percentage allocation that we're asking um, for them to go back to. Um, 71L um, is a requirement of a quarterly report uh, for us to be submitting. Um, we have a recommendation around the modification of uh, the report submission and uh, eliminating the requirements around expenditures and distribution since it's uh, duplicative. So this is one that we're engaging with Legislative Revenue Office on to make sure that we're on the same page about the report, making sure that the reports meet the intent and the requirements, but also don't create a duplicative um, system for us to do reporting out of. Um, Section 118C is around electric vehicle opt-ins. Um, this was one that we were seeking clarification on and whether or not the structure in the bill um, ensures the availability of electric vehicles to opt into ORGO and out of the EV registration fee in 2022 and beyond. So um, that's, again, one of the things we're seeking clarification on. Section 122L, um, is something that the Joint Committee actually had uh, some discussion on earlier this week. Um, we, in House Bill 2017, received 1% of the payroll tax to pay for what was coined the Technical Resource Center. Um, and we are asking for an additional 1% to pay for administrative costs as well. Um, it's our understanding that that may not be the path and that the 1% should cover both. And so we are engaging in conversations to make sure that we have the appropriate ask in our um, fix. Um, the next section identifies just technical corrections. Um, section 32 and 33, there was an incorrect reference um, to a subsection, so it's just a numerical clarification. Um, section 34 and 35 inadvertently left off uh, government vehicles um, as applicable vehicles in those sections. Uh, section 71D, Terrebonne was spelled incorrectly, so we've asked for that to be modified. And Section um, 118, um, we've asked for the road usage charge um, formula to be put in statute in the event that the triggers are not um, initiated, then it would just have the road usage charge formula in statute as opposed to directing it to a specific um, number, uh, if that makes sense. Um, and then under other items, Section 147, and I believe we've talked about this before, severability, we're working with Legislative Council to understand this a little bit more, um, but we want to make sure that we are not uh, required to implement something in the bill should the section um, be repealed. So uh, we continue to have conversations on that. Um, and then there is a technical uh, fix that we needed through Ways and Means that we're working with Legislative Fiscal Office on. Um, it's just a, a limitation um, move that's really quite technical in nature. Page five and beyond um, are technical corrections and policy changes that are being requested by other entities. Um, so while I have surface knowledge of those, if there are specific questions, I would be happy to address those. Um, but I'm going to avoid going through them and guessing on what some of them are. So uh, thank you. So uh, obviously, I do think a lot of those, a lot of them identified are policy changes. And, and as such, I'm assuming they would require legislation to implement. Um, technical corrections are truly just that. They got a wrong section in the statute identified or whatever it was, and it's just to fix it. So where the policy doesn't shift. And I do understand there's some gray area. But I think for clarification, 
Could you explain how these are going to be submitted? Do, are they going forward as a as an ODOT request? Does the commission have to ratify them as a commission request? And and some of these, I think, we may need to dig a little bit deep deeper if they are indeed a a major policy shift from where we are now or from what is identified in legislation. Um, yes. Yeah, so, uh, Commissioner O'Halloran. Um, the way that, um, and I'm sure there's a bunch of legislators sitting behind me, so they're, they're, they're welcome to correct me on any of this. Um, the way that this process has rolled out is that at the end of session on the Dash 10 House Bill 2017 amendment, we as an agency put forward testimony that flagged a number of issues that we would want to have further conversation going forward. And what we did is we took those um, as the technical fixes that we were bringing forward for a conversation through the technical fix bill. Um, we have, as I indicated, we have added a couple of ones that as we went through the implementation <coughs> process have identified like that there were additional questions that we had. So there are a couple of them on here that did not stem from that original um, testimony. Um, legislative, um, Legislative staff has been coordinating a compilation of all of the technical fixes, and ours um, went into that channel through their, the legislative staff who compiled the comprehensive list for consideration to the Joint Committee. Um, the Joint Committee during the February session will have three bills available, and my understanding at this point in time is that they are going to categorize what is purely a technical fix, what is a slight policy change, and what is a significant policy change to further the conversation on those three components. Um, so we'll be engaged in that um, at that level. Yeah, thank you. And, it, and I would just note that I, I think if it is a major <coughs> policy shift, um, we would hope that you'd come back before us and that if, if we're I just want to make sure that OTC and ODOT are aligned in our requests to the legislature before we go forward, that we're not saying different things or, or advocating different things in any, in and any I, way. And I think we had a good example. So the continuous improvement in our uh, in advisory <coughs> committee, there was a question around if it was a technical fix of getting what the uh, membership it needed sideboards. And I had heard part of the discussion was more that was the intent of it. It's meant to be at what the commission needs in order to fulfill that continuous improvement element. And so that was a piece where um, we had a discussion, and, and I think that's the value in it, making sure that uh, if it's under the purview of the commission that we are in alignment with what it is that we're asking to have fixed. Comments? Uh, I, and I will ask our legislators as well how they intend to move through this process and how we can populate that with them. Uh, do we have comments? Please. You have that look, <laughs> Commissioner Brown. <laughs> and I, I, it will be a little, uh, we will work with you outside of, because uh, I think a lot of this will be uh, in December, of which I know that that's a, a month that won't be um, available for you. but. We will need to insert ourselves into this work in a, in a deeper way than we have been in the past. And uh, it will require more of us as we go forward, not less. And so offering clarity to that and where we can um, guide this work uh, quickly and swiftly uh, would be important. So please, comments. I think this was excellent. I think looking at all the, the details and you know what did you really mean I think is really important to us, uh, you know, just looking at fiduciary responsibilities and you know, I work for a city. So it's not a direct Paula Brown respon fiduciary responsibility, but for the city of Ashland, I'm sure I could see that there would be conflicts. Uh, so I think we need to really get that intent. Also, just as a fun aside, I drive an electric vehicle. So with section 118C, although those aren't going to be paid until 2000. 22 and I might not have my electric vehicle, but it would be a benefit to me. So I think a lot of these, that's not the intent, and I truly believe that wasn't the intent, but let's, let's clarify that. Uh, but this is a lot of work, and I appreciate what staff has done on this document in particular by going through and, 
and highlighting what did they really mean by this. I know you've worked on this, Leah, for a while, and I appreciate the other input that you gathered from everyone else to try to make it clear. We want to meet legislative intent. We want to make sure that we're collecting monies from Oregon and then <coughs> spending appropriately on the projects that have been laid out. Not only those that were true earmarks, but the rest of the projects as well. Uh, we have a lot of people working very hard to get there. And so the execution of that, I think, is important. And that's what we're doing this for, not just to find misspellings, but really to find legislative intent. So thank you for doing that. OK, more to come. Thank you very much. We are a little ahead, ahead of schedule. Uh, would we like to, I, it's my understanding that Senator Boquist will be joining us as well, but co-chairs, if you would like to join us, uh, McEwen and, and Byer, please. Uh, Senator Johnson, it, uh, Okay, all right, I saw that. You are welcome if you... Okay, excellent. All right, okay. I'll let you know if she's getting out of her seat. How's that? <laughs> she is, so I'll let you know. I'll be your eyes and ears. So let me... Okay, well, let me first just uh, say thank you very much for joining us today, but most importantly for your leadership and courage in getting us to where we are today. The Commission understands that we share the goal of transparency and accountability, and they seem a little bit overstated in a lot of areas, but quite frankly, it's what's expected of us uh, in our seats as Commission members. We have our newest Commission member here today, so hopefully this is the Commission that you see for a period of time to come. Uh, we take very seriously the responsibilities that are in this legislation so that we can fulfill that for Oregonians. So we are working on a work plan to populate uh, with all of the uh, elements of House Bill 2017 that help us to really streamline that work. Uh, we understand that the commission today will look differently than the commission that was yesterday because it needs to. Uh, we have more expected of us and so more time will be necessary for us to commit. Uh, so we also want to make sure that the connection with the legislature and with you in particular uh, is not only meaningful, but actually is getting us to the objectives and the goals that we want to achieve. So adding that clarity as we start out on this new venture together um, is important how we set off on that journey. So uh, the floor is yours, however you'd like to. So uh, please, uh, in the, the light, unless it's red, uh, they won't be able to hear you very well in the back. Senator Breyer. It's a, it's a push down in the middle. There we go. All You're right. ready. That's worse. That's great. Well, well thank you, Chair Bainey. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Lee Byer, state senator and co-chair with my colleague here of the Joint Transportation Committee. Um, that was when we put this thing together last uh, year, it was uh, in the session, it was the first time we'd done this as a joint committee before. And our intent, or at least uh, I think the co-chair's intent, is to try to emulate the Washington state model where we combine the fiscal oversight and the uh, policy oversight in one place. So that was important to us, and uh, we'll, we'll see if the leadership allows us to continue that into the next session. As you probably know, each session uh, the chambers uh, get to write their own rules. They usually stay the same. But but we can't forecast what the next legislative session is going to do, and we can't bind the next assembly. So I guess that's important to keep in mind. Uh, really, when we started this, one of the things that, uh, I, I guess there were two things in my mind that were really big, and a uh, couple of comments that I'll get to that were made here since I've been here uh, remind me of that. One was um, we knew that we were not funding the system adequately to keep it moving forward. And I would say uh, we weren't funding uh, other modes of transportation that are important in a lot of the plans that you have at all, or very little at least. And we, we tried, and I think we did address that in the bill. The second thing, and probably just as important, and maybe more important, is it was clear to us at the start that, that there was a credibility gap between ODOT, the commission, and the general public, as well as the legislature. So. A lot of the time that we spent were trying to address uh, accountability, both in terms of real accountability issues and frankly also in terms of image. Um, and, and some real concerns about how much time you could put here. I guess one of the things that I would like to emphasize is I heard the comment of, 
wanting to decide what are ODOT's positions and what are the OTCs. And I would, I would like to strongly remind you that you are the Board of Directors for Transportation for the Department, and there should be no distinction between your position and the staff's position. In fact, we changed that so that you now are, are fully in control of the staff and, and within the constraints of what the governor accepts as your recommendations, the department's budget. So uh, I want to want to be real high on that. The other side that I would say, having spent some time on boards of directors, is I, I think there was a concern. I know the governor had a concern was, was there enough time? And, and I guess I would... I would like to say that our, my expectation, at least, is not that you get into the management of the department. In fact, I hope you stay out of that. Your job is to provide direction to the department and to provide the oversight of the department and make sure that the director is doing his job. <laughs> and if not, fix it. <laughs> so that's, that's at least my expectation there. A couple of the pieces that are you know, there's a whole accountability strain in here, and I don't want to go into the details, but happy to react to that if you will. Uh, we, we need to, it's very important that we build that reporting cycle back so that the public and the legislature feels like things are getting done efficiently and effectively, and you're carrying out the wishes of the public in that. So that, a lot of the reporting that may be a little bit redundant, we, we did that intentionally and try to make that as painless as possible. We do expect to have you in front of us a lot, and I guess my invitation would be is I would like to see on, on a lot of the reports a commissioner doing that, the chair or one of you, however you want to split that out. That's your business, not ours, <laughs> along with staff, so that we, we, we have the appearance, and, and I hope the reality to the public that th there is no difference between the commission's directions and what the staff does. So. So you have, you, you know, I think uh, Commissioner Holloran had told me early on, he says, we need to make sure that we can control all this, and I guess the ball's in your court now. You have all the authority you need, and so if, if it doesn't get done, it's you. <laughs> and uh, Senator, last month we spent a fair amount of time looking over what's governance and what's management, right. and we want to make sure that we are that policy direction and uh, not uh, determining whether someone has an extended vacation or not. So right. um, that's, that's an important role. There are a few areas that I think are really important to us. One of them um, is, uh, is the uh, value pricing or tolling, however you want to call it, in the metro area. It, I believe, was a very strong feeling to the committee. Certainly mine is that is the only way we're going to address uh, both the congestion in the metro area as well as get the projects put together. So there's some pretty clear timelines on that and requests. And, and I suspect that we've handed you a bit of a problem because you're going to get a lot of flack on it. Uh, we knew that going in, and I think you did too. So that's there, and I think we have to move forward on that, or we will never be able to uh, handle the transportation needs of the state. It's just reality. Unless the feds change what they do, which I don't think is likely. Um, uh, the other piece is we gave you, uh, there's a lot of construction projects. I think that's just sort of, vanilla regular business of the department and that, and I, I think you know how to handle that one quite well. Uh, and timing, obviously, is going to be a problem, and certainly as we get in into it, there's going to be some funding issues. There always is, and you know, we'll, we'll deal with those, with those as they come. A couple of big charges, uh, and they're, they're probably small in dollar amounts overall, but the multimodal facilities, there's some real expectations, particularly around the Eastern Oregon facility one, and I understand there's more in the valley. And for me, those are real economic opportunities for the state as well as, you know, we've talked for many years since I've been around transportation about uh, getting those containers off of the trucks and onto a train earlier. And I think this is our opportunity to see is that really possible or not. Uh, and it may not be. I think so. It may not be, but we have to put some effort into that. And, and we've asked the director to assign a staff to, to that to try and push the project, and he's done that, and we appreciate that. Uh, the one in Eastern Oregon is very vital to the agricultural uh, economy over there, and uh, if, uh, Representative Bentz has said that it's already shifted a pricing strategy on onions and given Oregon an advantage over Eastern Washington, which is that's perfectly fine with us. <laughs> It's, it's hard to make things happen in the rural areas, and, and that's one that's very good when we try to balance out over state. And I guess the last area that I would address, and it's one that I worked on a lot, is the transit piece. 
and, and that has multiple layers on that one. We, uh, we're, we were very careful in telling people we, the money that we're raising there was designed or it was, uh, there's an allocation formula, but those allocations are not entitlements. And it's really, we're looking to the commission to make sure that that works and what we hope we're doing <laughs> over time is building a network, statewide network, and I, the vision is that you could get on a bus in Depot Bay and go to Lincoln City and tr transfer to a, a state bus, get into the city, and, into Salem, and go see your doctor without ever having to change fares and have regular schedules. And obviously, frequency and reach isn't gonna work as well in rural areas as it does in the metro areas where they're more developed, but those are big tests. Our commitment to the public who testified on that is that you will mm -hmm. make sure that those systems who get money will use that additional money to expand reach to hard, hard to serve areas, uh, that you'll expand, that they will, not you, that they will expand frequency so that people can use it. And the example that I would use is the one I used a lot is people who are cleaning the buildings in downtown Portland are having to live farther out on the edges of the city where they can afford the housing. They're having to ride the bus or the train in and then sleep in the buildings because they can't get home on that until the next morning. We're trying to reverse that. That's a deal. And obviously part of that is trying to find an accommodation to address low-income people as well. So it's a big challenge to you, and uh, I wish you well on it. And uh, I, I think it's going to be hard. But again, uh, I know Leah mentioned the 1%. Our view on the 1% is we took 1% off the top to allow ODOT to have the staffing capability both to administer the grants and to provide technical assistance to those small rural areas to help them come together. Because I, what we don't want is a bunch of single city small transit systems. We want it to be a system that works for the citizens. I'm gonna stop, I probably talked too much. <laughs> <Cheers>. <laughs> Chair Bainey, members of the commission, it's, just, yeah. it's a pleasure to be here today. This is the culmination of a, a long, long, long path to get to this point. And I think that my esteemed co-chair has done a wonderful job of kind of laying out where we are at this particular point and what, what I think the anticipation of this relationship is being. And um, I think a couple of you I haven't officially met, and I'm delighted to have an opportunity to see you today. And and thank those of you who have gone through this with us over the last 18 months and traveled on buses and done tours around the state and the effort and the time that you put in in getting us to this point and helping us be successful in actually passing this, this enormous piece of legislation. So I, I just want to thank you for your work and to you, welcome. I'm delighted to have you here to implement this. And I also want to give a shout out to the staff who for the last, well, in essence, four years total has helped support us in getting to this point as well. This has truly been a, uh, this, this wasn't a um, single session issue. It's gone on for quite some time. Um, and to the fact that we're here is quite remarkable. So I think thank yous are, are due all around. And of course, to my co-chair, our vice chairs and our committee members who put in the, kind of the lion's share of the work in getting us to this point as well. And I think the Senator is correct. This is hard and it's going to remain hard for quite some time. When I walked into the building on Monday, immediately people were at my door who now know that the bill has passed. They've had time to take a look at it, and our, their eyes were enormous saying, what about this, what about this, what about this, and what about this? And I said, take a breath. You know, the committee was just formed three weeks ago, and we haven't met yet. Um, and we've got time to work through the issues that people are bringing to us now to make sure that we're thoughtful about how we implement this that we accomplish what we want to accomplish. Um, but it was really, it was very interesting to me to see how many people are now going, oh dear. Um, um, I had a couple of people in my office that intrigued me and that were interested in multimodal and we had a meeting twice a week for two hours for three and a half months and I didn't see them one time in any of my work groups. <laughs> And now they're coming forward with issues. So that was kind of um, in, uh, made me giggle just a little bit. So where were you when we were building the bill? Um, I also wanted to touch on the implement implementation of the things that now have come forward that Patrick is compiling. 
and Leah did a wonderful job of walking through this robust document, and I think it's fair to assume it will get more robust as time goes on, as people begin to understand the full impacts of what we have done. Um, and I just want to assure you that this is, this is very important to us, and some of these things are changes that we need to make, some of the technical fixes we need to make, and I think it's fair to say that some of the requests that are being made um, aren't going to fit into the plan. Uh, so back to the back to the kind of the, the 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 statement that this isn't going to be easy as we go forward. We all know that um, it's big, it's long term, it's going to take many years. There's a lot of moving parts, but um, now we're just kind of beginning to see the implementation phase. It's very different than what we were doing in the last session, and we welcome that. Um, Two things that I wanted to touch on just very briefly, and the good senator brought one up, and I think that the biggest disappointment for me in the package as it moved forward was um, our inability to move forward with a sustainable source of revenue for Connect Oregon for our multimodal system. Um, the, 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 the philosophy that we walked into this process with, and I think you've all heard that, that traveled with us, was skin in the game. If people wanted investment in a, in, a, in a sector of the transportation system, the question was, how would you like to pay for that? Um, and I think we were very successful uh, and very innovative in many, many ways um, with the way we implemented uh, registration and title fees, and we tiered them towards, uh, the, 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 as the gas tax diminishes, how we're going to cross that line and move forward and capture those high efficiency vehicles. So we did that. We looked at the biking community and said, how are you going to help us invest in biking infrastructure? And we did that. Um, and, and we did it in transit. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Senator. Madam. Uh, and, and we accomplished that in the, in the employee tax that is statewide that's going to make just, just um, sea changes in our transportation system, which we're all very proud of. But the, the one sector that is lacking still is Connect Oregon. And I just don't want to lose the thread of how important investments in that sector are outside the Highway Trust Fund. And um, um, we, I just want to make sure that that conversation stays very viable. I, I don't know if it's of interest to you, but um, the co-chairs and vice chairs, um, the, the day that, that we were able to have drafted a letter and submitted it to the presiding officers, uh, and to the co-chairs of Ways and Means asking for $50 million in lottery dollars in the 18th session to backfill what we have lost. Uh, and of course, uh, the privilege tax and the money that that will bring should it, should it uh, pass muster in the courts is an incredible opportunity for us to begin to stabilize that funding. And I just think it's incredibly important that basically all of the other sectors have done well in this, and that's the one that we are still struggling with and will continue to. Um, and so that was just something I wanted to draw attention to. Um, you'll have a chance to look at all the requests people have made that Leah didn't touch on that are outside the purview of ODOT and the other agencies. Um, and we will uh, work through those. We had those presented to our committee on Wednesday. The committee members now all have those requests. We'll be reaching out to them to get input from them on how, what they want to do with some of these requests. Again, we have technical, we kind of have some technical and policy, some are kind of in a gray area, and in the next um, handful of weeks, we will be ferreting out how we're gonna deal with each of these individual requests. So uh, once again, thank you for your help and welcome. We are looking forward to um, a, 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 a very productive relationship between our committee and the work that you are charged with doing and um, just want to let you know that we're here to help and um, looking forward to moving forward. We will want to weigh in as well on yes. some of the Please. technical and Please. policy uh, Please do. changes that have been proposed. We, um, I think that's an important role for us as we elevate our advocacy and our input into the legislative process to make sure that we are in alignment with where we're headed. And Trevania, so. this may not be the end of this either. I'm sure now that the implementation <laughs> yeah. has begun, uh, this list will continue to grow. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have um, bill drafts um, that, that Patrick is submitting that prepare us to move forward with these changes. Should, should they become changes at the committee and, and with your input, we decide to move forward with? We've got a long way to go, but um, it, the time frame is short. Yes. There's a lot to do, but the time frame is short, so we'll be working hard on it. It's wonderful. Thank you. We'll look forward to your input. Great. Thank you.
Senator Boquist, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, I am Brian Boquist. I'm the co-vice chair of the Joint Transportation Committee up until I make the next screw up and then I won't be. Uh, with that, <laughs> I would like to ro uh, welcome Mr. Van Brocklin to the new board of directors. And uh, I've got about three or four things, Madam Chair, I'd like to just cover. And I, I will do them out of logical order because I'm an illogical Republican. So therefore, <laughs> uh, we'll just go that way. I, I, I want to stay on the the topic that I just raised with Robert, and that is the Board of Directors. The single most important piece of the entire transportation plan, and probably the reason it didn't go on the ballot, and probably the reason we've got as, just about as much as we're going to get in a decade out of the voters, uh, is the fact of a transition of power. And that is a transition of power um, from the unwilling, kicking and screaming, but agreeable, uh, to where we are right now. And that is, is there is no difference between ODOT uh, and their board of directors, which is the commission. The commission is the ultimate power. Uh, everybody to my left, your right, is in your employ now. Uh, and everybody that's sitting in the back row uh, back there is in, is, is in your employ, and you are the board of directors that are responsible for them. The key point of this is there was a lot of discussion behind the scenes that uh, some of which you're privy to is, you know, what is the model for the board of directors? Is the chairman full time? Is the chairman like home rule? How do we do this? I don't think the four of us had an answer for that. I don't think the people who were opposed to what we we're doing had an answer for that. And it's really up to the new commission to decide what it is that's going to work. Um, I think there was one question behind the scenes and one question in public asked your new member. And that is, is do you have enough time? And that's the key factor here. Um, it, you know, what we're proposing to do now that is in law, and I want to point out now that is in law because it now takes votes to change it. So it, there are many of these people that are people asking for policy changes and this fix and that fix. And frankly, we can just say no by doing nothing and let you guys figure it out. And I think that's the key point. So as you move forward in this, I think it's going to be important for each of you members from the south, from the east, from the private sector, from the public sector to figure out, okay, we don't have time to do this, or we need, you know, more staff to do this, or, you know, I mean, it was discussed, uh, do we go to a home rule type structure in which one of the commissioners is full time uh, to figure out how to do this? That is something you guys are going to have to work through. Um, we listened to all kinds of ideas and kind of came to the compromise, which that's what politics is, of where we are right now. And so that's the, the single most important thing. Um, that leads to the things that uh, both of my colleagues uh, brought forth and talked about. I mean, there are sort of, you know, three categories of, you know, improvements to the transportation plan uh, that are being considered by the legislature over the next couple months. You know, some of those are just plain flat technical changes. I mean, uh, that, you know, unless, you know, somebody in the, the, the new board of directors or commission or somebody else raises their hand and says this is a bad, bad deal, I mean, those sort of technical changes are going to go forward. There's a second category out there that are slightly more than technical that are actually, <laughs> you know, I would say substantive um, definitional changes that are out there. Uh, that, in my category, uh, falls into the same category as policy, and that is, is that it is very good for us to sit in, you know, our hearing, and it's very good for the ODOT staff to come tell us something, but they're not the board of directors. So in this category of list that you're going to see and become familiar with, unless one of you members of the board of directors and the commission comes back and says, hey, this is the direction we want to go in the policy, or this is the direction we don't want to go on that policy, um, that's what I'm looking for. Other than that, it's like, okay, go back to your board and figure out how to do it with them, not, not with us. The last category I want to point out to you is, is that <clears throat> you're in a very awkward situation, uh, and that is, is that there are portions of this bill that some members at the state, the city, and the county have come to discover that they're trying to figure out what is defined and what it is. And that is, is because there are three distinctly different components in government that are impacted by this particular transportation package, state, uh, city, and county. And when you're writing legislation, unfortunately, sometimes you don't get the opportunity to say, ODOT, you screwed up, or cities, you shouldn't have done that, or counties, you need to do something better. And so there are some items in this transportation package that you know I know <clears throat> people have gasped at the state level at. Um, that weren't intended for the state and they're actually targeted, no disrespect, Chair, at the counties. And, you know, 
when you have 36 counties, there's the old adage that you always have one bad apple in the pot, you know, or 5% is problematically. So that category sits. And we have the same issue with the cities. And those are issues that, you know, because of the way law is written, that we're sort of going to have to work through you know, the implementation either at the rule level or figuring out and letting individuals, counties know that, okay, it's not going to go away until you, you know, clean your act up or your city. It's not going to go away to clean your act up or this is actually purely a state problem. We don't really have the luxury of saying, okay, state, you do this, city, you do this, county, you do this. Because what we're trying to do is develop an overall strategic plan and have an overall strategic entity responsible for that plan. And we had this discussion in October a year ago for you board members who weren't there. I mean, we were out, I think, at the Oregon Gardens, and, you know, I led the attack on our behalf, on our side. Uh, and But at the same time, you are, of course, one of the three cities, counties, and state. So you have this sort of differential in which you're kind of the, uh, I guess, the godfather of transportations here, or god peoples of transportation, but that's politically correct, whatever it is. And so you have this sort of strategic overreaching thing you've got to coordinate, but then you're also responsible for your your 50% of the pie versus the 20% of five versus the 20. And so you board members are going to, and you see I keep using board because that's really the direction we're talking about, uh, even though I call it commissioners. That's sort of the way we're going right there to try and make sure uh, that you understand that. Um, I don't know, maybe a year from now, um, Mr. Van Brock will say, no, I don't have the time. This was really a stupid idea for me to volunteer. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, or, you know our, our, our good commander in chief, clear to my right, your left, will say, hey, you know, this isn't working. Somebody needs to be full time and in charge of this ship uh, or this command as we're out there. I, I mean, we don't know. Um, what we do know is, is we tried to put together the best thing we could. Um, I don't think anybody here is surprised because, you know, the very day it passed, we transmitted a letter to you and said, okay, we already recognize there's some list of problems here, okay, so here they are. And, uh, and then we also, in the project list and things like that, realized that, you know, th the bag is probably somewhere, you know, around 25 pounds, and we got about 28 in it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're familiar with that. And we're here, you know, to be a partner in that and work with you. Um, I think, I mean, it's going to be interesting on our side in the last is, is that, you know, we did concede some power that we envisioned ourselves having at our level. And now there's even people who say, well, maybe we shouldn't have let you concede that because now we're going to hold the bag. And so even on our side, we're going to see some transitional issues of, you know, is there two transportation committees? Does the budget go first through the joint transportation and then to ways and means? And what is the cooperative effort to, to, to do that? But the single most important thing is, is we need roads to market. Absolutely. I mean, I, you, I can tell you, I will remind everybody in my cl little close right here, is we didn't end up with a, an interstate freeway system in the Eisenhower administration underneath the Transportation Department. It came out as a Defense and War Department piece to, you know, to make sure that we we're able to transit troops across the country and, and transit industrial goods across the country. And that remains to be the primary focus that we have here. I mean, economic development in the rural areas, economic development in Portland. As you know, if you, you guys hear all these arguments about, you know, 205 going around and, and, and the Rose Quarter, you know, bottleneck. And so I think you're all familiar with that. And with that, I wish you the best of luck. And uh, don't call us. We'll call you. No, please do. <laughs> well, well, I will find it. Yeah. I will say that we did uh, we did have some discussion and concern about the bandwidth of the five members of the commission and talked some about should we expand that to seven to allow you to have a little more uh, ca capacity to deal with that maybe through a committee system or something. But we chose not to, but at least I'm open. As you get into this, if you think the load's a little heavy and you could use a little more help, I'm open to considering that, broaching that issue. The other thing that I just, I, I didn't mention it before that I do want to bring it up. Uh, we threw a lot of work the department's way, and uh, certainly we our expectations is there's going to be an ask in the 18 and probably in the 19th session to deal with that. One of the things that I that we talked about in the committee that uh, frankly we're throwing to you to grapple with is how do you deal with that? What is that budget ask? And a concern that we have is not just the immediate costs, but the ongoing roll-up costs. You add staff. We're all hearing a lot about PERS and all of that. Um, traditionally, I think the notion has generally been or the, the bias default to add staff and do it that way. I think you need to think about that. 
Does it make sense, even if it's maybe a little more expensive to contract some of it out, some of the design work, so you don't have the tail or not? I don't know what the answer to that is. You know, Matt and I have chatted about it, but I think that's something as the board of directors through this department you need to think about and work with staff on. I would ask that you uh, realistically don't ask for more than you need in 18. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, Madam Chair, if you would indulge me as a, as a follow-up to uh, what Senator Byer just said, uh, <clears throat> think outside the box too. I mean, I mean, I, I've listened to all the arguments on both sides on staffing. I'm convinced that there needs to be additional staffing, mm -hmm. but then at the same time, I've heard some pretty interesting, you know, proposals. I mean, why is Region One in downtown Portland in the middle of you know Center Mass? when you know it might be better to have it and you might attract better people someplace else and that goes for anyplace else. Think outside of the box uh, because this, you know, this is a revolutionary opportunity for us to go forward and when we screw it up, we're not gonna get a second chance. It's important to note that we recognize that we are not the commission that will be here in 10 years. So we have an opportunity now to lay the foundation right in the legislature as well. This really mm -hmm. is a refresh for the department and for Oregon. And I don't know what we will need, but we've had discussions and in December, we're gonna get into a work session to really dive into mm -hmm. what's the model, what's the staffing, are they consultants, are they contract? What's the, as we're talking about strengthening the capacity for our city and county system and transit, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. making sure that we can actually fulfill those obligations. The same is needed here for the commission to make sure that we can fulfill our obligation as well. So that is, uh, Next point for us is trying to figure out what that looks like and how we can best serve and fulfill those responsibilities. I'm, I'm pretty sure that we're not going to be here in 10 years. Well, <laughs> so, Chairman, uh, this looks like I'm here two years. You're going you're to be here. You're up. <laughs> First of all, I just want to uh, thank you. And, and uh, Senator Johnson, I know uh, you always have a seat at the table. You may not want to sit in it, but it's always there for you. And um, But I want to one thank all, all of you for the work that you did um, and in this political environment it is a uh, Herculean accomplishment to have gotten something on a bipartisan bicameral basis uh, through um, that really has meaningful change for the state um, and I think uh, you have empowered us and I think when you came to us in Silverton you made it clear that our obligation was to set policy and to oversee the department. Um, and I think you have made it doubly clear that we are now empowered to execute on that. And I think if you're looking at what success looks like, um, there's, there's probably a thousand ways uh, we can fail to execute on it, but I think uh, ODOT successfully executing um, its role, I think, is uh, w will look like success. And I think they don't always get uh, kudos for the successful work they do, but um, often get highlighted for when something uh, doesn't go. And I think transportation is probably the uh, most tangible touch that most people have with government, whether it's their licensing, their registering of their car, their driving on the road. It's, uh, it's a very tangible thing. So. When you came to us, you said go big or go home. I think we, we helped put together a construct that was, that was big, knowing that it would be uh, constrained to get it through without it um, having to uh, require referral. And I think that's a big accomplishment. But um, I know that we will continue to talk to you uh, on this. Um, infrastructure is not free. Um, mm -hmm. As you know, it's very expensive in our, there's a lot of things we didn't do and there's a lot of problems we didn't fix, but I think it takes a, a big step forward um, when we deal with our colleagues uh, across the Columbia River. I think we've got to um, look at some of the models they did on congestion pricing and tolling and say, how can we learn from those, um, but at the same time not be handcuffed in having the conversations in what's possible here. Um, we are. The population is growing faster than we can do these projects and um, then we can execute on making changes. We are clearly not gonna solve congestion. Um, we are, uh, transit is something that everybody wants and I think we have uh, huge competing priorities with limited resources. And 
you know that, uh, we, we know that, and I think the challenge is how we prioritize and where we execute and how we uh, 